Hi, I'm Christina Dennis, and you are listening to The Recovered Life Show. Every week, we bring you a Recovered Life discussion about rewiring your brain and how understanding your brain will help you fully live your best recovered life. Remember, addiction is a life-threatening condition, and the information in this discussion is provided as a resource only and is not to be used or relied on for any diagnostic or treatment purposes. This is not a substitute when professional diagnosis or treatment is needed. Now let's jump into the discussion. All right, welcome everybody to Recovered Life Discussions. Um, The name of this discussion today is Rewire Your Brain. I am Christina Dennis. I am a recovery coach uh, who specializes in breaking codependent patterns. I think so far I know almost everybody that's in the room, but welcome so much. Uh, Happy to have you here. And in this room, we have been kind of conducting a book study uh, with uh, Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. Now, most of you've been here before, but you do not have to be reading the book to participate in this discussion or to uh, understand what's happening. It's important, um, though, that if you are in a place where you can share and join the conversation, it really adds to the room. So I'm going to throw out that invite right at the beginning and tell everybody uh, feel comfortable coming up uh, because it really adds to it. Um, I have been studying this book now for somewhere around three months, and it is so rich and um, and thought provoking and and you know i don't want it just to be about my insights so i really appreciate it if you're in a place that you can join the room a couple of ground rules this room is rebroadcasted as part of the recovered life podcast as well as available for replays on this app so when you come up to share please use first names only and of course always we always want to share from a respectful um, spot Um, I do my best to create a safe space uh, for everyone, but of course it's up to you if you decide this is a safe space. So uh, I um, really want to make sure that I've said all that up front so that we can all move forward in this discussion with, um, you know, with a feeling that that we're really here to take care of each other and grow. And so I'll do some quick housekeeping to talk about or a catch up to talk about why why we picked this book, Rewire Your Brain Room, or why we picked this book to discuss in Rewire Your Brain Room. And what this book is from Dr. Brene Brown is a deep dive into, I believe it's 120 something emotions. And the purpose of it is to give us more language and more definitions around our emotions. Now, we know that our emotions may be different than our thoughts, um, but we also know emotions can drive our thoughts. And if we have an understanding um, that we're not alone and that there are sometimes uh, definitions and belief systems that are not for our best good, we can replace them or add to them with these kind of definitions. This week, we will be doing the second half of chapter, I believe it's 10 or 11. My my partner isn't able to join me up here yet, um, but uh, it is places we go when life is good. And so last week, we kind of did half of it. It's such a good chapter. I'm very excited to have a conversation about some of these concepts because they really showed me, you know, like, wow, I, I have a practice of foreboding joy. And um, I've actually kind of known that for several years. So uh, we're going to focus on the second half, but to do a quick recap, last week we, we talked about joy, happiness, and being calm. And I think the overall um, information that came from this boy, book for me was that there is a difference between joy and happiness. And joy is defined by short acting, um, you almost indescribable moments of a positive emotion that don't have much to do with our effort. 
and joy is defined by a connection with uh, nature or God. And it's so quick and so overwhelming that it is hard to explain. Um, whereas happiness that happens in our life is a, a lower intensity emotion. And it usually is the result of some energy and some effort on our part. And I've just loved understanding that because I know that there have been moments in my recovery, this isn't a recovery room, where things were not as happy. You know, there were things that weren't going right. There were years where I struggled to, to maintain even uh, some sanity. Um, and I still had moments of joy. And so I loved that we did a deep dive in that, the difference of it. And if anybody is interested, of course, the notes are available for all 10 chapters. And so one of the, uh, I'll quickly list this. I may have already done it and I've already forgotten, but the emotions that we're gonna talk about today are joy, happiness, calm, contentment, gratitude, foreboding joy, relief, and tranquility. And uh, we left off after having kind of a quick little summary about calm and the way that we can do our best to create calm experiences and react in a calm manner. And, you know, I'll quickly write, say the definition of calm from Brene Brown's perspective, which is creating perspective and mindfulness while managing emotional reactivity. And what I loved about last week and reading this is that I realized that this is something, you know, that I can continue to work toward. You know, I wasn't a very calm person. Um, I had reactions that were completely understandable based on trauma. And I had an addiction to excitement, which is one of the hallmark uh, traits uh, when we are looking at adult children of alcoholics recovery. And I didn't like admitting that to myself, you know, at first. Um, but I knew the way I was living wasn't working. And with that, I think we're caught up. We're going to move forward on contentment. But before I do that, Deanna, are you in a place that you can uh, jump in? I want to make sure I don't rush you. No, I I am, and I just want to say thank you for your patience with me this morning. My cat is freaking out, uh -oh. so she's calm now. I just had to take some. I'm. I love that we're talking about calm right now because I too had to take some calm moments so I could show up uh, the way I am right now, which is better than I was five minutes ago. So thanks for your patience. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so happy that you're here, and I think this is going to be. This is going to be a great discussion. And Anne, welcome to the speaker stage. Good morning. I know you're on the West Coast like I am, so happy to see you here um, with your experience. It will be really exciting. So let's move on to contentment, which is such an interesting, um, I mean, I think that many of us want contentment when we first get into recovery. We don't use that word, or I, I guess I'll speak from my standpoint, I didn't use that word. What I wanted when I first, you know, decided that I would put down drinking was, was contentment. Um, and so contentment is about satisfaction. And I think, you know, we can look at it and go, yeah, duh. But it's very interesting the way that they explain contentment. There are Feelings, um, and I'll quickly say her definition, Brene Brown's definition, which is the feeling of completeness, appreciation, and enoughness that we experience when our needs are satisfied. Now, in, um, in the emotional world and in social uh, data and the social scientists that actually study it, there are two categories that emotions um, fall into. One is uh, low arousal or high arousal. And so what they share and where contentment falls is that it's actually a low arousal emotion, which I thought was really interesting because it kind of explained to me that there were times when 
my needs were being met. You know, we, we have so many great exercises to help us remember how to make, you know, make our mind start thinking about the things that are happening that are good, you know, gratitude lists, which we'll get more into. But I'm not sure that I, you know, knew what contentment was before reading this. And there were times when things should have been okay, but I was anxious, I was bored. Um, and I've met many people, and, and this is where I want to kind of turn to Deanna and Anne. And if anybody else wants to come up, please raise your hand. It's, you know, we have this glorious 45 minutes at, left, and I'd really love to hear from, from everyone. Oh, good. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks for coming up. So contentment, the feeling of completeness, appreciation, and enoughness that we experience when our needs are satisfied. It's a low arousal emotion. It's like that comfy pair of jeans, right, that you always put on. But I didn't find that I was very comfortable with contentment. And I kind of want to ask the group if you've ever even thought about that word contentment. And do you, is hearing that it's a low arousal emotion kind of giving you some aha moments? Because it certainly did me. Deanna? Thank you, Christina. Um, with contentment, I, I start, I am content. I, I actually started this by writing affirmations for myself, which was not planned, but I just started writing, I have everything I need. I am satisfied. I am enough. I am loved. And, and by let me collect my thoughts here. Um, it takes the pressure off. That's kind of what I want to say for myself is that being content where I am is nice, but sometimes I also feel it uh, takes away my motivation, which is a yes. personal yes. thing. Yeah, it takes away my motivation to like move forward and do amazing things because I'm like, I'm satisfied. I have everything I need. And then I also start to co not compare myself, but I guess I do compare myself to people that have less than I do. And I think I should be content with what I have and I am, but so I have to find the balance of feeling content where I am and still giving myself the space to set intentions and goals that can move me forward in what I want, but remaining content with myself. And yeah, that's, that's where I feel with the content. That's so good. I want to quickly, before we move on to the rest of, of everybody, and thank you again for joining us, <clears throat> I want to share this insight that she shared in the book that really made me realize that we have habits that, um, and our world has a pace that really makes contentment kind of feel like like it isn't enough, you know? And she shared about how, you know, with technology and with the, the way trends are going in human responses, you know, everything is supposed to be bigger and better. And she explained this little exercise that made me really see it, which is, you know, it, if you text somebody on your way home, like the, the person who lives with you says, I'm gonna pick up some milk. These days, we don't respond with a simple, okay, thank you. You know, most of us, and I'm, I'm included in this, we have a response that's over the top, you know, like she said, then, you know, here's the simple act of picking up milk, but the response through text is, you're awesome, you're number one, and five emojis. And I was thinking about that habit, that addiction to excitement for me, you know, that habit of it needs to be the best and the biggest. And I think that in many ways, because I was alive prior to social media being a way of life, that that kind of was that slow boiled frog for me. Like I didn't realize that I had kind of picked up the pace of the world around me and, and, and was struggling with things just being enough. And I had, I have to say that it, a lot of my personal work has been around getting used to things being enough. It was like my nervous system couldn't handle it. It needed to continue to be over the top. And so there's one question that uh, one marker when they are doing whole groups of studies uh, that 
that shows whether somebody's going to have contentment or be satisfied in their life. And it's 71% of this variance indicates. And the question is, all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? And I think if we don't orient ourselves to think about that, to really stop and start thinking about, well, really, I do have everything I need. It can easily get lost, even in even setting the intention for that. And so she, and I'm going to read this question that she brings up, which is very kind of cool and exciting. And it says, if we are not satisfied with our life as a whole, does this mean we have to do or get stuff that will make us satisfied so we can be content? Or does this mean we stop taking for granted what we have so we can experience contentment and enoughness? And I know for me, in my second half and, you know, my, you know, starting my 25th year of sobriety or uh, just celebrating, it's a lot more about the second half of that question. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, what, what a fabulous conversation as always. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Okay, so I... I believe contentment is um, is always evolving. Uh, for me, when um, when I was out there and I was not content, I was not happy with who I am as a person. Always looking for something outside of myself to validate me to whether it was uh, looking better, whether it was whatever it may be, it was like almost like something outside of me had to feed me the good feeling for me to feel content, which it was never really contentment. It was always, okay, one more thing. Uh, contentment uh, for me started happening when I started getting into gratitude. Interestingly enough, there's this little, little booklet, The Seven Main Aspects of God, that I always refer to for many years. Um, joy, as you were talking earlier, is a combination of life and love. And so when I I'm in my joy, and it doesn't have to be anything big. It could be that I'm grateful i'm i'm happy i'm you know i'm loving what's around me and i feel love towards people around me i feel love towards myself and i feel alive that's where joy is for me and so contentment you know basically is i guess around joy if I'm happy, if I'm, you know, if I'm loving what's around me, then I feel more content. Well, here's the other part. As I'm evolving, as I'm growing, it's almost like, okay, the resting place where I'm content, it's like, I'm outgrowing this. What do I need to do next? What am I being guided? Which I call my divine assignments, right? Um, what am I being guided to do next? And I go ahead and do the next thing. It's moving up to the next level. And then I do what I'm supposed to do. And I get content because I'm in the motion of the gratitude and life and love combination, very aware of it. And then I do whatever it is I'm supposed to do on that plateau, if you will. And then I move on to other. And so um, a lot of times I know I'm ready to move on when things are just great. Everything is wonderful. And there's something saying it's just not not quite right. Something is missing. I'm like, aha, here comes my next divine assignment. I actually get excited about it and I pay attention. I usually get it in my meditations or when I'm having a conversation with somebody, it shows up in a few different ways. I'm, you know, for me, I, I don't need to go into how it does, but that's how I expect uh, to get to stay in contentment because I, I, I can't possibly be happy in one spot when I'm always growing, when I'm evolving. How can I be content with the same thing? So that's how contentment shows up for me. It's being aware if there's something that's not feeling right and, I, and I'm in gratitude for what I have. I'm in gratitude for all the amazing things, but something is missing and I look to see 
what's my next step? What's my next divine assignment? And it just could be, you know, uh, it shows up in many different ways. So I'll just, I'll hand the mic over back to you, but that's how I experience contentment in my life. Oh, I love it. Thank you. I think it's really important that we talk about these things, you know, and share how we do it because, um, you know, one of the things that I've discovered as I coach people is that, um, We don't necessarily break down these steps for people. I certainly wasn't taught this. You know, I wasn't taught that you can, you can search for contentment and contentment is enough. And it takes, I mean, just everything that you shared was really, really helpful. And because I think that, that that's how we elevate our life. And that's what we're here to do is learn more and connect more. Tiffany, I'd love to hear your thoughts on contentment, whether, you know, how you do it or have, have you ever thought about it as a goal? Oh my gosh, this is such a good topic, Christina. And it's so exciting. I have been this last month as subbing in an elementary school. And so I was able to listen to you guys, but I wasn't able to share. So I'm so happy to be here and let my voice be a part of the conversation. Um, I remember so clearly, uh, my, when I first got sober, being in a women's group and I was, I was 27 when I got sober and, um, 11, 11, 99. And I remember this woman sharing about how happy she was and this was obviously way before the pandemic but she was sharing about how happy she was to have toilet paper in her cupboard like in the closet she didn't have to like use some kind of paper towel or whatever blah blah run out like midway mid roll she was like and i was 27 single and newly sober and i was listening to this woman And my, my turn came to share. And I was like, I am not satisfied with toilet paper. I want more than toilet paper. (laughs) And just having that feeling of like, you know, that, that dichotomy, I can just see it now, right. Looking back at it, like how, you know, for her, for her contentment piece that she, you know, had enough, she wasn't scrambling and, I really was kind of, I was in that adrenaline piece. I was like, you know, that was part of my drinking. That was part of my, my addiction. It's getting getting bad. Um, I can hear you. Is that just me or is every? Sorry. Oh, I'm, I don't know what I'm getting. Can you hear me now? A little bit. Keep going. Okay. Well, anyway, it was just, I'll, I will wrap up and hopefully you can hear uh, me some, but no, it's not no. working. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Kathy. All right. We'll see if Kathy's available in just a second. Um, we'll go back to her after Laura. Hi, Laura. Welcome. Oh, okay. sorry. I got... Oh, who would you like to speak next, Christina? Sorry, I Go got ahead, confused. Okay, sorry, sorry, no Laura. Problem. Um, <clears throat> contentment is a great one. It's a great one. The the more you, I I had a great awakening over the the word satisfaction a few years ago when something is satisfactory, and it it's made me think about the um the levels that we have of acceptance and tolerance and and happiness. Um, in in regards to so many things and uh, the feeling of contentment i for me contentment is the achievement of something so the end of the day i can lie in bed and be content with the day that i've had um it finishes things it's not a starting point and it's not a state of permanence for me every contentment for me is is different um even if i do the same today as and i do the same tomorrow that contentment i feel at the end of the evening at the end of the night will be different because there'll be different experiences. Um, so for me, it contentment reaching that state of contentment is is a is a, a step. 
and then you take another step um, when when it's complete. Uh, I you know it, you don't I, for me you don't stay in it. Um, everything for me is always about moving forward and and trying the next thing and and um, stretching. So um, it's a beautiful feeling, for, but for me, uh, permanent contentment is is not not a doable thing. It's something to be achieved. Um, so yeah, that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I some things that you just said I actually wrote down before the room, so I feel like we are just right on the same page. And this conversation and what you just said is speaking to my heart about exactly where I am right now. So both Tiffany and Kathy and Anne, everybody just shares just like today, I'm open to receiving all of this because I know this room isn't for me, it's for us. But what you said about, about moving forward, always moving forward. And I had, I wrote that um, I, I want to continue to set intentions and goals that move me forward in life and not stuck. And I wanted to say stuck in contentment, but I want to be in contentment, just constantly moving forward. So I, I loved that share. Thank you, Kathy. And if we are ready for you, Laura, if you are available. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura. I'm an alcoholic. What a good topic. So when I think of contentment, I think of something my ex-husband said to me, and he said, you're never content. It's never enough for you. And so I've had a lot of years to sort of think about that comment. And in a lot of ways in my uh, 30s and 40s, he was right in, this, in, in that I wanted more. Like I wanted the house to be better. I wanted, um, you know, more improvements, um, I, I don't know. I thought if I, I thought if we had more, or it was very materialistic, and I drove a lot of really bad decisions because of my lack of ability to be content of where we were at the moment. Like we just redid, for example, we just redid the kitchen. How about just be content with that instead of having to now redo the bathroom? You know, um, we we were always on a tight budget but yet I spent anyway because I couldn't get content. Now when I think of contentment, yeah, and I think back on that, and I think in a lot of ways he was justified and right with what he said. And, and I hate that about, I hate that, you know, to be able to admit that, but I have to admit it so that I can grow. And so now when I think of contentment, when I think of my life, when I think of what I have, what I want, I try to really let, contentment be that step of being in a serene, peaceful place. What do I have? What do I need? How, what is my current state? And be content that I'm, I'm working a 12 step program and I have a higher power and I don't have everything, but I have enough. I actually have more than enough. Um, when I look at how many, you know, clothes and shoes I own. I'm like, dear Lord, you have more than enough for a small country. So stop, stop materialistically and also stop with the, uh, needing more in my recovered life, needing more that other people can't give me and surrender it and say, it will come when, when it is time. But in the meantime, Appreciate what you have. Look where your damn feet are and look around you and say, this is enough. I, I do have enough and I am content. So I think my message for me is, you know, there's the materialistic part of contentment. And then there's the this spiritual um, relationship part of it that really more haunts me than anything else now. I think I've, I'd like to believe I've learned my lesson in the material world. But um I still struggle with it because if I, if I don't, if I don't consciously practice contentment, I get very sad, I get very depressed and I get very anxious. And all of those things lead me to another drink or they lead me to a miserable day of just being unhappy. So, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of what I have on the subject. Thank you for, um, I love this room. Thank you for opening the space and letting me speak. 
Thank you, Laura. I thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I, I can so relate to the material accumulation and, um, and I, and, and I've also learned to understand that that is, that is well designed in our world, you know, that, that we, we don't come by this belief that the more we have, the happier we will be on accident. You know, that's that <laughs> there are some very big, uh, budgets being spent on creating that very feeling and that belief system. And so it's, um, you know, I just feel lucky to be in recovery myself um, and think about the fact that, you know, we're having a conversation about it, that it's important. And, you know, Brene Brown brought up something that was really interesting. She said after 2020, she thinks that most of the world, if they were offered a life of contentment, versus a life of, you know, extreme uh, excitement that many of us after the pandemic would see the value in uh, contentment. And I, I agree with that. I agree with it. Kat, I'd love to hear your thoughts on contentment and, uh, and just, you know, we'll move on to gratitude after. Hi, Christina. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone's um, input. I, I absolutely, like a lot of people, love that we're talking about contentment. Just the word makes me feel like, ah, oh, yeah, that, that's the stuff right there. Um, <laughs> especially, um, you know, restless, irritable, and discontented is, you know, what I knew for so long while I was using. And I think for me, contentment, you have to, I don't know, I, I had to know what discontentment was because to even discern what contentment is and, and you're, when you're in this perpetual state of discontent, that's your normal. And um, it, I think for me, contentment comes from my basic needs being met, of course, like food, shelter, warmth, water. Like I think that those are things that, um, you know, connection and love is things that are kind of the building blocks to contentment but i can pretty much like clearly remember the first time i realized i was content and it was after a meeting and i had gotten involved with the fellowship and started reconnecting with people and coming out of my shell a little bit and i was like oh my gosh like wow wow what is this feeling i'm getting it is so strange and it is so beautiful and um I don't know. Contentment for me can be found in like so many different areas in meditation in um, you know, being with friends. And even when like on paper, this year has not been my year. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. Like it is not, it's been the hardest year in my sobriety, but um, despite it being so difficult, um, I've I've acquired the skill of being able to find contentment even in the storms because I've been taught like there's always something, you know, to be exact. Like I, I think, um, and gratitude, there's something to be grateful for and to just like stop and look around and pause and, um, letting go of the expectation and the dreams and the hopes of what I think I should be because it's already like fact, like I don't know the best thing for me. Like I don't. Um, well, you know, that's what they say. Like some, <laughs> most of the time I don't, in some aspects of my life, you know, once I get perspective on, on better perspective on, um, humility and what's right and what's wrong, then I have a better understanding of contentment because then I can ask for what's realistic for me, you know? And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's cool to be in a place in my recovery where I can look within myself to find the contentment and it's not so based on like the outside world and um, the things that I have or the job like prestige or any of that. It's it's really internal. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. If you are newly sober, trying to get sober, or you've been sober for decades, 
and are looking to take your sobriety to the next level, the Recovery Breakthrough six-week transformation concierge coaching program might be right for you. Have Damon Frank and Christina Dennis build a custom roadmap to get you on the path to getting what you really need. Receive hands-on concierge coaching and stay focused and productive with our daily check-ins. If you're ready to experience your recovery breakthrough and start the journey towards the transformation you deserve, book a free get to know you call today and find out what is possible in your recovery. To find out more about recovery breakthrough and to book your free call, go to recoveredlife.us. That's recoveredlife.us. You're listening to The Recovered Life Show. Mm, Thank you, everybody who came up and shared. I so appreciate us carving out the time. And, you know, Deanna, what I think I'll do is, um, are you able to locate the quote from Robert Emmons, uh, the leading researcher on gratitude? It starts with research on emotions shows us. Yes, I can. What I think I'll do is I want to read this, but after, or I have asked Deanna to read it, after I want to move on to foreboding joy, um, because I think that is is something that is really important. And um, I know that we recently did an entire um, show on gratitude. And um, many of us, thank goodness, have a practice of gratitude. But I think that this is so such an important quote to kind of um you know consider when we're thinking about gratitude so if you would read it um i I would love that thank you yes absolutely um i actually have this in my notes to go straight to page 213 if you have the book it's really good on page 213. okay research on emotion shows that positive emotions wear off quickly Our emotional systems like newness. They like novelty. They like change. We adapt to positive life circumstances so that before too long, the new car, the new spouse, the new house, they don't feel so new and exciting anymore. But gratitude makes us appreciate the value of something. And when we appreciate the value of of something, we extract more benefits from it. We're less likely to take it for granted. Do you want me to keep going? Yes. Yes. Okay. (laughs) In effect, I'm trying to find where the end of the quote is, but in effect, I think gratitude allows us to participate more in life. We notice the positives more and that magnifies the pleasures you get from life. Instead of adapting to goodness, we celebrate goodness. We spend so much time watching things, movies, computer screens, sports, but with gratitude, we become greater participants in our lives as opposed to spectators. And I'm just going to read the next part too, because yes, to re- yes. let it resonate. The two lines that resonated with my research are, instead of adapting to goodness, we celebrate goodness. We become greater participants in our lives as opposed to spectators. So good. And she talks about how adapting to goodness without feeling the gratitude is a function of scarcity. And so I just, I want to, I want to make sure that we hear that because it was the first time I've ever heard that information. And I've done a lot of studies on gratitude. Um, and it was like, wow, there is a real function of it. And we know it's an upward spiral. The more that we um, cultivate gratitude, the more happiness and joy and contentment we have. And so if anybody um, is part of the Recovered Life community, you know that we did a recent show on the sati- sati- uh, science of gratitude, and I just feel so lucky to be in a recovery community um, where we regularly think of things. So a practice of gratitude, I'm sure we will discuss it more in the future, but I really want to move on to foreboding joy um, because I think this is something that is part of our human experience. And for me, it was absolutely one of the things that robbed me of joy. Um, You know, Brene Brown shares that joy is the most vulnerable human emotions. 
and and you know worse than fear you know we're scared more of joy than we are of uh fear or anger or any of that and it seems so backwards i mean she studies shame right <laughs> and grief but foreboding joy is something that we do uh to try to protect ourselves and and she goes on to say if you're afraid to lean into good news wonderful prom uh, moments of joy if you find yourself waiting for the other shoe to drop you're not alone it's called foreboding joy and most of us experience it practically universal experiences that every time we have something good we are thinking that something bad is going to happen and part of foreboding joy is that we think we're the only ones who do it so when we lose our tolerance for vulnerability joy becomes foreboding and this is something that i practiced coming from a trauma experience uh, i realized that every time something good was happening to me I was so afraid of the pain of having it taken away that I would fantasize about that. It was like I was trying to prepare myself for the other shoe dropping. You know, she says, we're terrified of being blindsided by pain. So we practice trauma and tragedy. When we push away joy, we squander the goodness that we need to build resilience, strength, and, mer um, and courage. And I... <laughs> You know, I have to say that this isn't the first time I've thought about this. I read a book uh, seven years ago that is called The Big Leap, and it's more of a business book, but he speaks about this phenomena of how when something good is happening, we can immediately um, start bringing in and ushering in these thoughts, and, and, and actually we're trying to settle ourselves down and I can tell you that this was something that I practiced, even in long-term sobriety. And the way that I would do it is if things were happening that were great, you know, I met my husband, things are going well, uh, certain things are being handled. All I had to do to stop that fear was start thinking about my son. And I would actually do it to myself. I would start thinking about him and who was going to take care of him after I pass. And I mean, I can start to cry even thinking about that. And what I realized at that time was that I didn't have a tolerance for things going well, even in sobriety, even as a coach, I still struggled with allowing the good in. And so I want to kind of express or see from the group that has come up if you also experience this, um, because leaning into joy uh, is really hard. Deanna. I saw Anne flash her mic and I'd love to see if Anne would like to contribute first. Sure, Anne. Oh yeah, my gosh, I, I did that so much i did so much uh, that i just i couldn't really enjoy the joy in my life and when i started digging into it what it boiled down to for me is i did not trust myself to show up for myself i was not in integrity with myself i would make plans for things i would say i'm going to do certain things and i would not complete them so as a result the good things that i was expecting to happen would kind of fall apart you know maybe i wouldn't show up in a relationship the way i should i would not show up and complete things the way i should i was out of integrity with myself and the people around me and um, uh, without going into a lot it basically had to do i didn't feel worthy and so i sabotaged my own my own joy and so of course if you don't show up i mean if i say i'm not going to drink and i and then i go and drink i don't trust myself not to drink and if i drink bad things happen i mean you know that's the foundational piece but then again that mindset had to shift and until i started when I, actually this was an affirmation when i am in, in integrity with myself and others 
it will happen. Whatever it was that I was concerned about, whatever it was that I wanted, whatever it was. And so I started breaking down, doing what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. If I'm not, go ahead and figure out how it's going to get done or communicate with the person. And it doesn't mean it has to be at that moment. Sometimes you need a little bit of time to discern and giving myself the time to discern and acknowledging that's what it is. I'm looking for the information to make the decision instead of saying, oh, I didn't do it again. It's like, well, I did not complete what I needed to make the decision. So that space is also very important because it's so easy for me to say, you said you were going to show up there and do this today, but wait a minute, we don't have all the things we need to complete the project, if you will, right? And so I don't know if this is making sense, but understanding this, the process that I go through, being hard on myself, and then understanding how I get things done to be in integrity with myself. That's when all of it started to fall into place for me. So I hope this makes sense. I hope it helps somebody because it was like a switch. You know, it was a pivotal moment for me, and it still is. And I'll hand the mic over to you. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing real life experiences you know, with this, um, that is one of the biggest traumas that I have dealt with also, um, the stop, stopping, abandoning myself, um, because I didn't think I was worth it. Um, Deanna, did you want to share before we go to yeah. Kathy and Kat? Yeah. Um, I would like to share something that happened this weekend, actually, that goes really hand in hand with this. Um, somebody took a photo of me, which without, without knowing, which was fine. Um, I was celebrating somebody's birthday. It was a small get together in a restaurant and I didn't know the majority of the people that were, were sitting there with us. And I was excited about getting to know these people. Um, and I am very different from all of these people. And I was totally cool with that. I had my husband with me, but something I, I'm going to read something from the book really quick. Cause that's how I'm tying it into this. Um, rather, it says that in the midst of joy, there's often a quiver. And I felt this quiver. That's why I'm sharing it. A shudder of vulnerability. Rather than using that as a warning sign to practice imagining the worst case scenario, which for me, the worst case scenario was these people aren't going to like me. <laughs> who cares? The people who lean into joy use the quiver as a reminder to practice gratitude. and. What was interesting about this was that I decided as I started feeling like these people don't get me, I decided that's okay. Stand in your own, stand on your own, be authentic, be kind, listen, but be who you are. And what was interesting was that I was feeling loving and I was feeling a lot of joy for being invited to celebrate someone. That was a big deal to me. I don't get a lot of invitations. So as I'm sitting there and I somebody I said something, oh, I love that. And they were surprised by my my love for whatever small thing it was. And then this great conversation started happening about I said, I just love people. And the people there were like, what? I've never heard someone say they love people. And that was like, what, crazy to me. But then, so this all happened, it was fine. I, I sat there and I just felt grateful for being in this presence. We were all very different, but I was grateful. And then later somebody sent me, it was an employee at the restaurant, sent me a picture of me with all of these people just really paying attention to me. And I didn't notice that then, but he said, you were talking about love and everybody was listening. And I just thought that that was strange. It was awkward at the moment, but now I feel, I feel like what I did was I did not forebode the joy I had inside of me. And I went, I quivered and I was like, be vulnerable and just say that you love everybody. And I did. And I feel like those people felt it and it felt good. So that's why I wanted to share about that. Thanks for listening. Oh, that's so, that's really beautiful. I, you create such a vision of it. And I love that. And it does have something to do with foreboding joy because it is 
a matter of being vulnerable and and saying this. And this is one of the reasons why I was intent on sharing about what foreboding joy looks like. And so, Kathy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this, you know, very real universal emotion. I'm I'm actually going to pass on this one. Sure. I, I need to collect my of course. Thanks. Absolutely. Kat. Hi. Yeah, I'm kind of, um, I, I, that's why I love being in this room because this is something I have not um, looked at or reflected on. Um, I guess, you know, the awareness hasn't been brought to that, but I can tell you I definitely do it. Um, so I guess, um, you know, now that, well, I guess, you know, it makes me feel human that everyone does it you know um it's when i think um it turns into martyrdom victimhood when like a good thing happened right like i can do that i can like let like have something incredible happen like um on my birthday um i got this like summer dream job at in the uh, pageant of the masters in Laguna Beach and I'm like so excited about it but immediately after it's like all these reasons why you know I shouldn't be um, and maybe it's a way to keep me safe um, a way I guess it comes from a place of survival um, and when I look at it that way, um, you know, I don't have to live in survival mode um, anymore, you know. And the undoing of that is, um, yeah, it's simple but hard work and um, rewiring our brain, so to say. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I totally, um, it's a very odd thing to happen, but... Um, to do it anyways comes like the courage and the faith and jumping into the unknown and you know that's where the gifts and um, the realizations come right like wow I actually did that or um, wow I actually allowed myself this joy in my life um, so yeah I guess those are my thoughts thank you thank you and so it's really awesome to hear somebody who's you know just kind of looking at this as a possibility. And, and I was that person, as I've said, you know, double digit sobriety, trying, having to admit to myself that this was something I did to myself. And I have a lot of compassion. Um, you know, in this room in particular, we've talked about the hit um, of when we worry about something and that comes true, that there's actually a pleasurable uh, hit in our brain that's very similar to gambling addicts and you know as as we start to realize that which is why we're doing this book in this room specifically it's that psychological flexibility that keeps allowing us to move forward and um, I want to read a quote that is not going you know we're not going to be able to pull it apart but perhaps we need to do another hour on foreboding joy and fear, you know, uh, that joy is actually the most vulnerable emotion that we can have. And this is from Marianne Williamson, um, and it, it, it gets thrown around a lot, but it goes into exactly what, uh, what, is, what is happening in us. And it says, our deepest fear is not that we are in inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. 
And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we liberate, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And um, I love that it that it shares from that because for for many of us, and I, I would dare to even say all of us who find ourselves grappling with recovery, there is this fear of being big. There is this fear that we will hurt others by our you know, thinking highly of ourselves. And it's very layered because, you know, the one thing that most of us have in common is that things weren't going great for us when we were out there in the world. And so you, so for me, I thought, oh, in order to be right-sized, I needed to be small. Or in order to make other people comfortable, I needed to stay small and not actually engage with some of these talents. And that really reminds me of the phenomena of foreboding joy, truly. And so I know we're almost at the end and I want to quickly highlight some of the things, the other two emotions, relief and tranquil environments. And so I'll quickly run through them um, just so that we can put a, a period after this chapter. Um, relief is a feeling of tension leaving the body and being able to breathe more easily. Thoughts of the worst thing being over and being safe for the moment, resting and wanting to get on to something else. And uh, she shares the, you know, uh, sigh function, which I just recently wrote a blog about. If anybody is interested, just, you know, hit me up and I'll get you on the mailing list about actually sighing is a reset for our nervous system and it's necessary. And I thought about all the times that I've held my breath. Um, and, you know, in my blog, I talk about how actually allowing ourselves to sigh when we're getting information that isn't pleasant is, is more helpful than even deep yogic breaths. And so it was pointed out to me, oh gosh, probably two months ago, I feel like you need to sigh. And, I've, and I have made a practice of sighing as a way to reset. Um, and then we'll move on to tranquil. And I hate rushing this, but I think it's so important to understand tranquility is something that we should, um, that we should look at and put it on our self-care list. And tranquility provides many elements that we need to, in, uh, to counter mental fatigue and attention depletion. And there are four essential elements to restorative, um, to a restorative environment. Um, you need to have a sense of getting away you need to have a feeling of immersion and you need to hold attention without effort um, and combat compatibility with performance. And so as we close this room today, I just want um, to kind of put that on everybody's radar that maybe today you need to take a big sigh and maybe today as a self-care action and as an actual building block to more recovery, you need to cultivate moments of tranquility. Um, they are, you know, such as field and forest, a large body of water, um, and urban settings really don't allow our body to go with contentment and tranquility. Nature, low levels of noise, and so as you're sitting in your recovery plan, um, which we talk about on Mondays in this room, um, perhaps look at your calendar and see if there are moments that you need to make space and to actually treat your nervous system um, and give yourself the gift of that. And Deanna, uh, thank you again for helping me co-mod such a beautiful room. I encourage everybody to pick up this book, Atlas of the Heart, and take the time to read it. Go to Recovered Life. Um, you can follow me and get all the notes of each chapter. And um, just I thank you. 
Keep the conversation going. Join Recovered Life, a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives. Membership is free, and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.